पलपन विसरे नहीं जो विसारी जो गल चरण सोल चिन्न जे नजर समीपे रहो अमारी एह नजर समीपे रहो अमारी एह गणेशम महाराज नी जय हरि कृष्ण महाराज नी जय स्वामी नारायण भगवान नी जय सुप्रीम ओम माइडी the path maker to our liberation in our utmost dear maharaj puja guruji puja santo and all of you devotees jay swami narayan before we get started on today's presentation there's another question that is asked by this intriguing hari bhagat that we would like to answer to the best of our ability this hari bhagat is from the uk and uh i'm going to read his question first and then we'll answer afterwards jay swami narayan i hope all of you bhaktos and santos are doing well i would like to ask one question that would cover the subject of loss how should one view loss of a close friend or relative from a spiritual perspective should one be emotional also how did the nan santo cope with the prasang of shri ji maharaj passing away so there's two questions first is how can how should one view loss of a close friend or relative from a spiritual perspective should one be emotional well looking from first looking from a worldly perspective or a spiritual perspective emotion is a natural state of each and every human if something happens bad or good our reaction is displayed outwards being good suppose we win the lot- lottery our emotion will be very excitement uh very very ecstatic very happy and suppose we become bankrupt in our business we would become very sad we would become very depressed we would become so much so melancholy that we would want to do something that is against the scriptures or sastras emotion is a natural state each and every human has that bhagwan swami narayan has given even animals have emotions but the subject at hand is should how should one view the loss of a close friend or relative from a spiritual perspective well first and foremost when we look at this body we should first think that when i was ver- a baby how was i right now hi how i am and then in the future when i grow older how i will be and what will happen to me to accept the natural cycle of life and death is something that is definitely needs to be implemented in this very question acceptance each and every human when they are born and when they attain a certain type of understanding at the age of 7 8 9 10 10 they know that they have to let go of this physical body one day or another it's a natural state where spirituality may you be involved in it may you be not or may you just know this knowledge you've learned or picked up generally from um parents or from school academics life and death death is a natural cycle that everyone has to accept there is no one that can escape from it so that's one thing from a spiritual perspective if we look at it each and every person has a soul now 
if we want to look at it in that state, we have to look at the soul's characteristics and the body's characteristics. The human body's characteristics are completely different from the characteristics of the soul. The soul is completely different from the human body, yet it lives inside of it and does each and every action through the indriyas, we, we can say. But it is different from the body. When this body is shed off, the soul will be carried over to another body, may it be a human, may it be an animal, may it be an organism, may it be a bird or a fish, etc., so on and so forth. But the, the soul is different and the body is different. First, let's take a look at the, uh, the characteristics of the soul. Since we're looking at it from a spiritual perspective, the characteristics of the soul, according to the Shikshapatri Slok 105, is the, the, the jiu, or the soul, dwells in the heart, and it is as subtle as an atom, meaning that's how small it is. It is conscious and it's knowledgeable. By the power of perception, it pervades the whole body. It is impenetrable, indivisible, indestructible, and eternal. These are the characteristics of a soul. Now, comparing that to the characteristics of a body, the body, it's all completely the opposite. The body is going to die one day. It is, it can be pierced. It can perish. It will perish, we can say. Nonetheless, it's not, it doesn't have any knowledge inside of it. We probably are thinking our brain has knowledge, but the soul is the one that is providing and igniting that knowledge inside by spreading throughout the body and into the brain. It's all the knowledge is of the soul. It's not of the body. The body is completely, if we think about it, it's just dead. But the energy house behind the body moving, talking, is the soul. And even the energy house of the soul is Bhagwan Swaminarayan who is inside of the soul constantly. That's a little deeper in, but going back on the surface, the body has complete characteristics that are opposite. The soul has complete characteristics that are opposite. When we look at this and when we think about these kinds of characteristics spiritually, then we understand that that person may be a relative, may be a close friend, may be even a satsangi, has gone to Bhagwan's abode, Akshardham, the soul, and this body has just shed away. Actually, there are bhaktos that are that may have. It has been um, noted that there is this bhagat that had a daughter at the age of sixteen, who used to live in Mumbai. And the daughter, from ever since a young age, listened to Kathavarta and made a diary and actually very much was intrigued by satsang and this was a soul that was obviously had accumulated many merits from the past life so at such a young age a lot of knowledge activated and from that diary um it was read that you know uh, i'm not the body i'm the soul i am different from the body uh you know i'm here to please bhagwan i'm, I'm here to attain bhagwan swami Narayan. all these different thoughts were written inside of the body now this daughter of the Hari Bhagat got cancer and passed away at the age of 16 or 17 if I've forgotten and the Hari Bhagat's knowledge or the level of understanding instead of mourning or instead of becoming very depressed or sad the Hari Bhagat actually through the streets of Mumbai uh, had like an utso or like a festival that my daughter has gone to Akshardham, my daughter, meaning the soul of the daughter, has gone to Akshardham and she has married with Bhagwan Swami Narayan. All these kinds of different thoughts. Now, that Bhagat obviously has emotions because an emotion, remember, as we first covered, is a natural state of each and every human. But that emotion can be diverted. That flow of emotion can be pointed towards a certain kind of direction. Now, in the world, people point it towards mourning or becoming sad. But this Hari Bhagat, 
actually took it a completely different direction and actually actually through a festival in celebration that my age, my daughter at the age of 16 went to Akshardham and this Hari Bhagat called many of his relatives, friends and they did this kind of festival in the streets of Mumbai. So this is also a type of understanding and if such a type of understanding is gained then there is no kind of sadness, no kind of pain, no kind of depression, no kind of melancholy or sorrow feeling about any of the per, uh, er, any of these kinds of situations even occurring. So, saying that, that's the spiritual side. I hope that answers one of your questions. And the second question that this book had asked was, how did the nun santos cope with the passing of Sri Ji Maharaj? Well, the nun santo Bhagwan Swami Narayan brought them from Akshardham. There were 500 of them. And Bhagwan Swami Narayan brought them from Akshardham with him. There were Anadi Muktos. And they were at an extremely high spiritual state. But due to the attachment of Maharaj, due to Maharaj's alluring, alluring acts and alluring actions that he performed on earth, they were very much attached to Maharaj in that way. And when Bhagwan Swaminarayan went to Akshardham, before that, he notified his santos and he gave the santos strength, invisible strength to cope with his passing. So, Nan santos definitely had emotion. They cried when Bhagwan went to Akshardham. Even there are santos that by the name of Sachidanan Swami, who was such an affectionate sadhu, that when Maharaj declared that he wanted to go to Akshradam, before that, Sachidanan Swami, through his yogic powers, left his body and his soul went to Akshradam before Maharaj so that he would not have to experience the viyog, or you can say the lack of presence of Maharaj. But Maharaj then did a leela and Sajjan Swami hid underneath Maharaj's siyasana in Akshardham. And then Maharaj was obviously there at all times. Bhagwan is always present there. And Maharaj looked around and Maharaj knew that Sajjan Swami was there. So he took Sajjan Swami out underneath uh, his, um, his siyasana and he said, what are you doing here? He said, Maharaj, I cannot bear you leaving me. So that's why I came up here. Maharaj said that I am commanding you go back down in your body and do satsang to Hari Bhaktos. I haven't told you to leave your body yet. And Maharaj sent Sachidan Swami back. But that was just a charitra. But in reality, Nan Santos had the ability and strength to cope due to Sriji Maharaj's invisible, you can say, energy that was flowing through them. But Maharaj, after his passing, his, his physical body, Gave darshan to Dada Kachar, gave uh, gave him a garland, a rose garland, put it around him. Gave darshan to Gopan Swami, Muktan Swami, and they could see Maharaj everywhere doing those leelas. So, Maharaj, maybe say it in a physical stance because we're on this earth and we have this physical perspective. Maharaj may have left this body at the age of forty-nine, but in reality, Maharaj was there present at that time. Maharaj is present here right now with us and Maharaj will always be present here in the future. There is no doubt, there will never be a doubt that Maharaj was not here or, will not, or has disappeared and has left this earth. It's just not possible because through here Piyuda Gansham Maharaj, Hari Krishna Maharaj or maybe any Murti of Bhagwan Swami Narayan, Bhagwan Swami Narayan always inspires and gives darshan to his devotees and through that, devotees develop such kind of niche or faith. So this is the answer to your second question. I hope it uh, answers uh, your questions and um, you know feel free to ask any questions if you do so ha do so have. Uh, now we would like to move on to our presentation on a bow and a gun, a cancer cell. Bhagwan Swaminarayan has discoursed in the Vachnamrut. And the Vachnamrut 
is the most, you can say, supreme scripture here on this earth. Bhagwan Swaminarayan has spoken and his nansanto, all four of them, have written down these lectures. There were 262 chapters that are compiled which are called the Vachnamrut. Now Bhagwan Swaminarayan out of many, many topics, Bhagwan Swaminarayan has talked about destroying sabhavs. Bhagwan Swaminarayan has talked about ego. Bhagwan Swaminarayan has talked about the maima and his own glory. Bhagwan has talked about how to keep vritti and his murti. Many, many topics have been covered. But out of them, Bhagwan Swaminarayan talked about abhav and augun the most. Because Bhagwan Swaminarayan knew that at that present time and in the future for all these devotees, this is the one thing that will keep them and take them away from satsang if it is not destroyed. Abao and Augun, what does that mean? Well, let's take a look at it from an example. Over here on the screen, you see a white surface and a black dot in the middle. Now, the first thing that any human perspective or, perceive, or any human perceives is the black dot, not the white surface. 99.9% .9 of humans would see the black dot first and then the white surface afterwards. Any reason why? What is the reason why we see the black dot first and then the white surface. If we think in our heads, to be exact, we have this kind of vision which is a little negative. That negative vision is ingrained in each and every human. And due to that, it's very, very difficult to remove and understand the true and right perspective. Now, if we look, at times, we're so focused on looking at the black dot, we do not see the bright white surface. This is what happens. That dot, that small dot, is Abhau and Ogun. For example, a person is filled with innumerable divine qualities. But if he has this one bad virtue and it is portrayed in society or if someone has seen this bad virtue, then that vir bad virtue is thought about. Every time that person walks by, that bad virtue is seen and everything else is washed away. Nothing else is seen. That bad virtue is highlighted and inside of that person's mind, every time, it's just running through that person's head, no matter what. Now, the black dot or that bad virtue, we can compare to be the same and the good virtues, we can compare to that white surface. This is what happens. And to give a small definition, Abhau and Ogun is basically looking at the bad faults of someone and developing an ill feeling for them. Looking at the bad faults of someone and developing an ill feeling for them. Now, there's many, many times, and where does Abhau and Ogun happen? In satsang, not outside in the world, no matter what. Suppose that you go to a store, suppose that you are out somewhere you see people smoking you see people drinking you see people even doing things that they're not supposed to you'll never develop a bow ogun of them you'd never be like oh this guy is like this this guy because it's a norm it's a normal feeling in society if someone if you have a convenience store and some guy comes and asks for a pack of cigarette or a, a bottle of beer you're not going to be like, 
this guy smokes and this guy drinks alcohol, this guy is a bad guy. No, it's a natural feeling that this is a customer and I am the business or owner. I am just selling him his product and that's it. You don't think further than that. There is no about an ogun in the world. But in satsang, a person comes to mandir every week, performs sun samagam, does as much as bhakti as possible according to his capability, reads the sastras, reads many things, does seva as a das or a servant, but has this one bad quality of, we can say, uh, running around in mandir. Now, doing that, everything else becomes erased. The sun samagam he performs, the sastras he reads, the bhakti he does, none of that is seen. But what is seen? This guy, every time he comes to mandir, this guy, bhagat ne, not bhagat, this guy, every time he comes to mandir, he's always running around. There is nothing... He's doing all this sun samagam and he doesn't understand that you cannot run in mandir. This is the type of perspective one views. But they cannot see the other four or five virtues or many other virtues that this person has. This is a bow and ogun and this is what Bhagwan Swaminarayan does not like. And this is what Bhagwan Swaminarayan wants to remove in this satsang. That's why he specially dedicated Avachnamrut Gadada, first chapter 17th. And he said that such kind of ill, you can say, behavior in satsang needs to be removed. And whoever does this, takes a bow, guna, is even a part of this, should do an ufas. Bhagwan has said in this Avachnamrut Gadada, first chapter 17th. It's a negative influence in satsang. Now, if Bhagwan is trying to, uh, you know, take this out of us, then why not make an effort and remove it? It's only going to cause us pain. And that kind of pain will never be removed. This Abao and Ogun is kind of like a cancer cell. How so? Let's first take a look at this video and then we'll explain onwards. say radioactive waste or we can call it cancer these are all cells and that small neon you can say part that that one cell touched is cancer due to that one cell touching 
that cancer spell, uh, that cancer. All the cells in the whole city, meaning we can see the whole body, got cancer. And it spread very, very quickly and rapidly. Ogun and Abao is just one small negative aspect that we highlight and enlarge with our magnifying glass. And we keep looking at that, keep looking at it, keep looking at it. And due to it, we don't even know it. Slowly but surely, we fall from the path of satsang. Our physical body will be good, but our mental state, the state of our atma, the state of doing bhakti and the state of sansamagam will be destroyed due to taking negative abhav and augun of others. Our mind will become disturbed. We would become very, very saddened. We would become depressed. We would feel like we need to do something in order to annihilate or remove that person or to go away as far as possible in an isolated place. Such kind of a disease will kill no matter what. Now, why do we get a bow and ogun? Jumping to conclusions. We often don't hear both sides of the story. Sometimes in Mandir, there is a misunderstanding and we only hear one perspective and we jump to conclusions and we presume that this is what it is. I know this person for years and definitely this person has done this. So I'm going to accept this person's point and pretty much that's it second taking sides we follow what our friends think even if they are wrong we don't know if they are right but due to our friendship due to that that emotional state that we are very close to a person may it be a devotee may it be a non-devotee but we accept ac accept their their perspective or view and that's how Aubau and Ogun occur wanting to improve others all the time we feel as if we are perfect and that it must be someone else's imperfection that lead to a mistake oh yes this is a very big cancer cell we think we're perfect we think we can do everything correctly we think that we have the best abilities. We think that we have the best skills. But we just don't know that there's many, many people who have better skills than us, better virtues than us, better attributes than us. Straightforward. We cannot accept it because of this abhav and ogun. Fourth, not clear on our goal. Our goal and our direction should be the same, to please our Maharaj and Guruji. Taking a bow and ogun is driving in reverse. Our goal is to please Maharaj and Guruji, attain their Rajipo, attain Akshar Dham. But we feel that we, w we want to ignite, fuel our Sabaos, and due to that, a bow and ogun arises. And finally, ego and jealousy the most dangerous of them all, blood cancer. Ego and jealousy will cripple one, maybe not today, but in the near future. Ego and jealousy completely change one's face. One day we're looking at this face, which it has a divine aura, which is very, very, very enthusiastic. And due to a bow and ogun, Due to that ego and jealousy, that person's face becomes completely darkened. You don't feel close. You don't feel like even going to that person because of these two negative swabaos. These are the reasons that Abhav and Ogun happen, according to my perspective. And we all know, don't judge a book by its cover. 
but we do. If it's not decorated nicely, if it doesn't look good, if it doesn't have the pictures of what we're looking for, if it's a plain background with just a name, if the title is very boring, if it doesn't have a lot of colors and features on it, we feel that this book is going to be dull. We feel the book is not worth reading. We feel that this book is a waste of our time. But in reality, to put it straightforward, the Vachnamrut, straightforward cover, just a murti of Maharaj, and it says the Vachnamrut. But that Vachnamrut has the ability to perform our Atyantik Kalyan or ultimate liberation if we read it and if we digest it and if we implement it into our life. But we think that this is the Vachnamrut, a very boring cover, no pictures, no nothing. It doesn't have anything on top. And we forget about the other perspective that Bhagwan Swaminarayan has said the Vachnamrut, he has spoken the Vachnamrut, and these are Bhagwan Swaminarayan's words. And due to that, we throw the book to the side or we don't even care about it. And our authentic Kalyan is lost right there and then. The Vachnamrut has the ability to perform our authentic Kalyan if we follow it, if we understand it, if we implement it into our life. But our perspective, our mind's perspective, judging a book by its cover, always, always, and always, this is one thing definitely to remove. Disadvantages. In the process, we harm ourselves the most. This is the most biggest disadvantage. The person that you're taking the bow and ogun, that person is not hurt. That person will, uh, that person's mental state will not be harmed or damaged. But definitely, our mental state, our spiritual state, will definitely decrease. And due to that, we will become far from Maharaj. We would become far from Guruji. We would become far from these santos and bhaktos, and we would become far from this satsang. That's why this is the biggest disadvantage of taking a bow in Ogun. Thus, according to the Vachnamrut Gadada middle chapter 27, thus a person wishing to attain liberation should not harbor any vicious feeling towards anyone. If he does, then he is sure to develop such ill feelings for tor towards devotees of God and then eventually towards God as well. Bhagwan Swami Naran says, first and foremost, whoever wants to attain liberation, do not take any bow of Agun or of anyone. But suppose you do, then you'll start to take uh, you'll start to take a bow and Agun of devotees of God, and eventually you will start to take the bow and Agun of God. Why did God not do this, and why did He do this? Why is he making me sad? Why is he making me depressed? Why did he not give me this job? Why did he not do these? All these kinds of, is he God? Is he not God? What's going on? All these kinds of doubts will start to arise. And due to that very factor, Bhakto, we will not be able to attain ultimate liberation. And we will have to keep going in this cycle of life and death. Now let's take a look at a journey through history and see just how Abhav and Ogun has affected history. And this actually, Charitra, happened in the time of Bhagwan Swami Narayan. His name was Sadguru Param Chaitanan Swami. Yes, Sadguru. Sadguru is a title that's given for elite saints or very senior and high saints who have actually attained very, very virtuous attributes and who can also help others attain such kind of attributes. Attributes. Param Chaitanan Swami was regarded as a senior sadhu by Bhagwan Swami Narayan. So much so that Bhagwan Swami Narayan would, the gifts and clothes that were gifted to Maharaj would first go through Param Chaitanan Swami. Such kind of praise was given to Param Chaitanan Swami. Maharaj praised him much. Many, many santos praised him. And due to that praise, due to that ego, 
he started to develop inside some kind of negative feelings. Ego began to sprout from this. One day, Maharaj was having his head shaved by his barber, but his barber was very rough and his hand was very shaky. So another Hari Bhakta went to the village and called for a barber who was actually good and complete at his shaving. Afterwards, Maharaj's head, head was shaved. Maharaj sat in the assembly. Maharaj sat in the assembly underneath a tree and he was de 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 delivering discourses. He was saying Kathavarta. Now two senior sadhus who were late in attending the assembly came and sat in the back of the assembly. Now what happened was they came and sat in the back of the assembly but in their mind they were thinking when will Maharaj call us up front? When will Maharaj call us up front? Since we are seniors, when will Maharaj call us up front? The all-knowing and omniscient Maharaj said firsthand, Does anyone know what the physical form of ego looks like? Everyone's looking around, scratching their heads. They don't know. Like, no, we don't know, Maharaj. Please tell us. These two santos that came from the back are the physical forms of ego. And those two santos were Param Chaitanan Swami and Purnanan Swami. After Maharaj said this, Purnanan Swami the ego ignited so much that he took a bow in Augun of Maharaj and left satsang and ran away. Param Chaitanya Swami, his ego also developed and he ran away, but he was still a satsa, uh, he was still in satsang, he was still Maharaj's sadhu. So what had happened was he did not want to leave satsang, but he did not want to ask for forgiveness either due to taking the bow and augun of Maharaj. That Maharaj, how could he say this to us? We are his senior saints. We are these great saints. We have been saints for this, many time, this much time, this many years. We have done this and that. How can Maharaj not call us up front and instead insult us by saying, does anyone know or does anyone can anyone see the physical form of ego? It's right here. How can they say that? How can Maharaj say this to us? So Param Chaitanya and Swami left for a while, tried to get rid of his ego, but nothing happened, and he went to Dharampur, where he spoke about the glory of Sriji Maharaj to the Queen Mother Kushal Kurbai through Hari Bhakta. Param Chaitanya Swami still had faith in Maharaj. His ego was there because he had been insulted. Maharaj just wanted to destroy his ego. But Param Chaitanya Swami knew that Bhagwan Swaminarayan is the Supreme Lord. He is the Lord of Lords. He is beyond this all Kal Karma and Maya. Param Chaitanya Swami knew this. So he preached to Kushal Kurbai and Maharaj found out and Maharaj became very pleased upon him and Maharaj called him back and became pleased after Maharaj had returned to Akshardham the Jaljini Utsa was celebrated in Gadara during that time Param Chaitanya Swami met Sadguru Gopan Swami and for three days Gopan Swami and Param Chaitanya Swami did satsang and Gopan Swami removed Param Chaitanya Swami's ego and then finally Param Chaitanya Swami went to Akshardham. But this Abhav in Ogun takes us far from satsang and it's a cancerous cell and the Abhav in Ogun's root is ego, a three-letter word that can break our bones in a second. That's why, dear devotees, we have to be careful. But not to worry. What is the chemotherapy? What is the process to remove this cancer cell from our bodies if we do have it? From our spiritual bodies if we do have it? 
Is it surgery? Is it chemotherapy? There is numerous ways to remove cancer, but what ways do we need? Well, our Puja Guruji, who is utmost dear, shows us five exact points. Number one, to read satsang books regularly. Sastras such as the Vachnamrut Swami Nivato, Sadguru Gopan Swami Nivato, Sadguru Gunatitanan Swami Nivato. If we read them regularly, we'll develop a perspective through the Sadguru, through Maharaj's vision that if I develop a bow and ego, I will become like this. How can I negate a bow and ego? How can I remove a bow and ego, uh, a bow, ego, ogun? How can it be removed? Well, Maharaj shows us in his Vachnarut and Sadguru Gunati Tanan Swami and Sadguru Gopan Swami show it through our, his, their vato. Number two, keep the mind busy. Do satsang related activities. Do the nine types of bhakti. Do satsang related seva. The nine types of bhakti that Maharaj has mentioned. Listen to Kathavarta. Such kind of techniques by keeping the mind busy will remove that abound and ogun from our mind. Number three, pray to Maharaj. Pray to Maharaj that please help me. I'm going through a hard time. You are my savior. You will save me from this. This is your examination for me. I am not like this. I am the soul. I am not like this, but you are giving me an examination. Help me pass this. Pray to Maharaj with chant Maharaj's name, Swami Narayan, Swami Narayan. Anytime anyone's about Ogun comes, chant Maharaj's name. Maharaj's name is so powerful that it can remove poison from a cobra. Then what is to say about a thought? Of course it can be removed. But we have to have faith in what we're chanting, Maharaj's name. And finally, perform Sun Samagam, the most important of the five therapies or the five types of you can say antidotes or medicines that will remove cancer is sun samagam by performing sun samagam by opening up by sharing our thoughts by 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 reflecting upon bhagwan swami narayan's views through the sadhu's mouth that abau and ogun is removed and a niyam i can say or a kind of trick we can say for every five that's not guns but every five goons take it for every for five goons for every uh, of goon meaning suppose you develop an ogun of someone meaning a bad thought take five qualities five good qualities that you have seen or have you have experienced and 100 percent, i will tell you that for sure you have seen not five but hundreds of qualities but that is all shedded that is all clouded because of that one highlighted of gun if that can be removed by these five then one will live in an ocean of bliss in satsang without any trouble and slowly but surely through maharaj and puja guruji and santo's grace and these haribhakto's grace we'd be able to cross this ocean of maya and attain Bhagwan's abode Akshardham. That's why Bhagwan Swaminarayan has mentioned this topic the most in his Vachnamrut. Because Maharaj is afraid, the Ekantik Satpurush is afraid, and this cancer cell is not going to stop. But we have the ability to remove it. We have the ability to change our vision and our perspective in every action that we do and we perceive in others. To look into the hearts of everyone, to see Maharaj, that's a view. It's a very difficult thing to do, but if we start today, then it will happen tomorrow. But Maharaj's view is like this. The Ekantik Satpurusha's view is like this. So all the weapons are there all the therapies are there it's just now time to take it into implementation and put it into a practical basis so today's lecture concluded included about an ogu and how and how it's a cancerous cell and how we should be afraid in satsang of this very very dangerous disease
just like how we are afraid in the world of this virus we call COVID-19 that is currently causing havoc throughout the world. In the same way, if we are afraid of this, then we would be able to stay away from it and experience bliss of Maharaj and Puja Guruji and Santos and Bhaktos and this Satsang. Saying this, my humble Jai Swaminarayan.